FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Carrie Lutz, and it is August 30th, 2017. Hard to believe summer is just about over. Well, what's happening in Houston? What's happening with the dollar? What's happening with gold? Where's it heading? Bob Hoy is with us uh, once again. Always great to hear from you, Bob. And love to hear what your wisdom and your experience tell us about what's happening now. Harry, thanks for your kind comments, and it's good to be with you. Yeah, you've got huge news items. The Houston storm, and it's doing immense damage. Of course, the left has gone crazy with it. This is all due to CO2 and modern industry, but that's not the case. Um, it'll eventually get sorted out and fixed, but in the meantime, it's a very impressive amount of damage being done. But the interesting thing is that it really didn't push the price of crude oil up that much. Yeah, you've had a sympathetic rally in uh, gasoline, but then you've had a huge amount of North American refining capacity down. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's something going on with the oil patch stocks, and that goes back to where the resource sector got hit down to January uh, 2016 when the price of crude fell to $27. And also base metals got hit very hard in that, and the base metal mining index, XME, it, it fell to a third of its high. And um, then you also on the same move, which was a disaster in crude oil, the oil stocks, XLE, only fell something in half. So that then reinforced in my point of view, is that there were a lot of people in the oil patch stocks who are basically were holding for a disaster in the Middle East and or a disaster in the Gulf, and it didn't work. So now I think these people are liquidating holdings because the two, the reason for holding was a, a, a hedge against disaster. We've had disasters and it doesn't work. And of course, this reason for that is the immense uh, increase in production uh, from the tight oil, the shale stuff, and also natural gas market is changing. So this is uh, fascinating stuff from the historical point of view because the uh, price of crude oil is going to continue to stay weak, um, and it's it's a, a it's a resource technological revolution. And if you go back to the 1880s in um, Montana, the uh, the base metal miners learned how to mine large or good size high grade copper and the production of sword. Then in 1910 is when Bingham Canyon was put into production. Bingham Canyon is just south of Salt Lake City. And that was the first really low-grade copper system to be put in, one of these copper porphyries. And Bingham Canyon is still operating. So that was a tremendous revolution in, the, in producing low-grade copper. Then in the 1970s, you had Newmont uh, learned how to put into production at that time, which was, you know, um, uh, considered a low-grade system, a large low-grade system with the Carlin, Nevada type deposits, mm -hmm. and that was a revolution. So now, what you have now with the the shale uh, production and the ability to discover it and the ability to put it into production is absolutely phenomenal, and it is a natural step to uh, efficiencies in in in, a, in yet another resource sector. So. The price of crude is going to be uh, continuing weak, uh, we figure. So, and this goes back to oh, 2014 when uh, it was trading about 107, and I pointed out that in previous <laughs> serious contractions, the price would fall to one third of the high or one quarter of the high. And those prices, I remember, based on the 107, worked out to 37 or 27, and we didn't know which, but briefly got down to 27. So, mm -hmm. But this would be on annual averages. So uh, you get something like, say, $30 on an annual average. Oh now, that gosh. will be interesting to the industry. So then what we want to do is also take a look at, uh, at the base metals, and we thought that they would rally this year out through it in into into august and they have done very well the index uh, gyx is 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 done well and uh, within it 
Uh, Zinc has had a hot run. We think uh, copper has a little further to go. But one of the things that we are looking at here, Kerry, is that this could be the culmination of the great bull market for stocks. Mm. And we've got a historical guideline for this one, and that mm. is that since the first bubble, the South Sea bubble in 1720 blew out, that one's notorious, like people know about that one. But decades ago, when I was doing the historical research, I noticed that there was a big commodity peak nine years earlier. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So let's look at the other big well-known bubble, which was 1929. And indeed, you had a huge commodity blowout in 1920. So you got this nine-year spread. So then I went looking through the rest of history. And yeah, there was a huge bubble blew out in 1825. And there you had a, a, a good commodity high in 1816. So this is the pattern. 1873 is another one, big bubble in stocks culminated in 1873, and it was preceded by a commodity high and a high for the CPI in 1864. So here we are. Now, the, the last really big high in commodities was 2008. Remember when crude oil got up to $147? Mm -hmm. So here we are nine years later on that old model. So if the stock markets were not speculative now, then that relationship of nine years later would be of no interest. But what is of interest, Kerry, is that you have a speculative stock market. And indeed, our technical uh, measures put this as it's, you, you know, the last time you had speculative excesses like this was in 2007 and in two, in 2000 going into March 2000. So uh, yeah, you've got something historically going on. Now, of course, those two dramatic bull markets, the uh, dot-com bubble in, that culminated in 2000 was unique, but it wasn't preceded by uh, an important high in commodities nine years earlier. Mm -hmm. But on that one, we just used the uh, yield curve and credit spreads to determine that maybe the top might be around March, and it, it was. And then in 2007, that was the same thing. We're using the changes in the yield curve and credit spreads to call the, the culmination of that one. And then now, but that one didn't have, wasn't preceded by a, an important high in commodities nine years earlier. So this one, Kerry, mm -hmm. has very important histor historical features. Right. So this is where we're watching it very closely. And the, the credit, the excesses in technical side, that basically momentum and sentiment are, have been right up there, about as high as you can get. And so we're just waiting for it to roll out. Now, as a game thing, we go back to our work on credit spreads and the uh, yield curve, and particularly of interest, and I'm just working on it right now, is the uh, short-dated uh, interest rates, such as now Treasury bills. And in the past, there used to be the uh, call money, which was the rate at which uh, brokers and bankers would lend mo money to each other. And it was a very good representative of money market conditions. So. In eight, the bubble in 1873, you had, as usual, short rates went up with the boom. That one was until June, and then it declined. The, the, and the, the decline in the uh, then the call money uh, indicated that the biggest part of the bubble was in, and people were getting careful. So, and that bubble peaked in September of 1873 in the U.S. Then the next one, 1929, in in June, the T-bill rate went all the way up till June and started coming down. And that then was the signal of uh, that the boom would soon be over. And here we are now, The uh, this time the three-month bill increased to 1.18%, which is not a big number, but then it was down to 0.18%. So it's a big it's a big. Uh, relative game. Mm. And that peaked in June and has been declining. It's down to, well, it got down to 1.00 1. a week or so ago, and then it's just having a little correction here now to 103. So just looking at short dated rates, the action is similar to June of 1929, and it's also similar to June of 1873. Both of those were the year that a classic financial bubble concluded and a long contraction followed. 
and people are going to say contraction, deflation, Great Depression, call it what you will, but the importance to gold will be is that in a great financial boom like we have been in, uh, the real price of gold has a tendency to go down. By real price, I mean you, you deflate it by either the producer price index or the, or the consumer price index. And yeah, it's come down from 2011 and it's sort of been parked for the last few years, not going down much, but it's staying down. But it is down from where it was in 2011. And this is confirming that the real price of gold would be sort of down when a great bubble was blowing out. Now, all of the bubbles to back to 1720, the real price of gold did decline in the final few years of the mania and definitely went up in the first three years after in, in the contraction. Then each of those bubbles, when they collapsed, they marked the beginning of a very long contraction, usually in the order of 20 years. And uh, that then was approximately 20 years of the real price of gold going up, uh, such that production increased and uh, the gold stocks did very well when the rest of industry was suffering competitive pressures in a long contraction. I should take care that also the usual three to four year business cycle continued. Mm -hmm. So then you would have uh, bull markets where the stocks went up and you have a, a, business, a brief business expansion, and then it would go back into a more severe contraction. So, and the gold would, the sector would go opposite to that. So what we're saying is that quite likely the contraction will become noticeable in the fall, which isn't so far away now. No. And it's just going to take a little more uh, increase in widening credit spreads and the yield curve uh, taking a turn to steepening, and it'll push off a contraction. I think there's a very good probability that this will happen. And of course, we're just, you know, we're just at the end of August now, and our target on the U.S. Mar stock market was a high going into into September. So this is where we then put together sort of a checklist. And one question is, is the stock market up when it should be? Yes. Are there signs of speculation? Oh, indeed. And how sound is the story behind the bull market? Well, it's the latest thrust is that with the election and Trump getting in office, that would then bring about a reform. Uh, it's a pro-business government attempting to be pro-business. Mm -hmm. So that then is the story. But and I think it eventually it'll happen that the pro-business side of uh, politics will will gain ascendancy. But actual reality, realization of lower taxes and, and this sort of stuff will be slow moving. And the credit markets are moving on their schedule. And uh, I just was thinking here now, Kerry, that, that we're on the path that leads to a contraction. So then you might say, well, there's no guarantee that events will continue to follow the path, but then there's no guarantee that they won't follow the path. So it's best to play the odds. And I think it's highly probable uh, a serious contraction comes in. Uh, commodities will then be weak. You know, you've got the usual seasonal weakness for uh, copper prices uh, that appears into November. Crude oil as seasonality is down into December, January kind of thing. So that would be part of the contraction. And um, the uh, that would then begin to move the real price of gold up. But the, st the gold stocks are going to be vulnerable to a problem in the big stock market. So it's best just to kind of stand aside and keep some of your powder dry on the gold sector. But in order to be optimistic uh, about the future of the investment side, well, then the best sector will be uh, the precious metals, and particularly the gold side, because when you're into um, a post-bubble contraction, silver seriously underperforms gold. So uh, this is where I wouldn't favor silver stocks, but I would certainly have a list of the re of the gold stocks you like ready to go uh, on serious lows stay into November. 
Mm -hmm. So what do you think for 2018, Bob? Is that going to be an up year for precious metals and a down year for the economy? I think that's, you carry that's as simple as you can get it, and it's going to be so. But the other thing is, you look back in the 1930s, the, the gold sector was vibrant. It was fabulous. The, uh, the, senior, the senior stocks, like Homestake then, uh, in the crash, got down to about $8.50. Then for the next year and a half, 1930, 31, you could have bought it for $9 a share. Mm-hmm. And then when it started to move, now by the time by the end of 1932, Homestake stock was up something like 130 percent, and their earnings were up about that much as well, with no change in the price of gold because it was still fixed at 2067. But what it was is their cost of mining had come down, L- wages, labor, um, the cost right. of blasting, uh, you know, right. carbons, all that stuff. Just- this real price went up enough to make the gold producers profitable before Roosevelt raised the price of gold in 1933. So all he did was raise the nominal price from twenty dollars to thirty-five. And but in the meantime, Mother Nature was raising the real price anyway. So eventually, Homestake stock got up to mid sixties. But the key the key thing is that in those days, the gold miners paid out uh, everything by way of dividend. So on your $9 purchase of Homestake, through the 1930s, it was paying $4.50 a share dividend. Absolutely incredible return. In the meantime, your stock had gone to $60. So this Mm -hmm. just illustrates that in a post-bubble contraction where deflation is bothering everything else, the gold sector has done very well. And that has been the case on uh, four out of five of the long post-bubble contractions Right. Since the first bubble appeared in 1720, as a matter of fact, the great gold rushes in history have occurred at the bottom of the Great Depressions that follow as a bubble. 1895, Klondike, um, then 1840s, uh, California, and those were at depression bottoms when the price of gold in real terms was high. And also the, with the depression, labor mm was, was uh, there's not that well, many employed. So then unemployed went looking for gold. So uh, mm-hmm. ah, I love it, Kerry. This is, this is going to be fabulous once we get past the financial storm this fall. And it, it won't be too kind for uh, portfolios of ordinary equities, but it'll be very exciting for the gold, for the gold side. Right. Yeah, well, it makes a lot of sense. So what about the fact that uh, gold has just broken 1,300? Um, it's, is yeah, it we, my technical guy, we had the rally on gold, and we're now getting early signs that the move may be maxing out. Mm-hmm. We're also got early signs that the decline in the dollar index is maxed out. Right. So somewhere in the next few weeks, this could be quite a serious reversal with uh, the uh, with the dollar going up and the uh, the precious metals going down. Now, here's another one that history illustrates is that when you're going into a credit contraction, I've mentioned the, what happens mm-hmm. to the curve and what happens to spreads, but actually what uh, a really good telltale is silver. Mm-hmm. So say somewhere in the middle of September, if silver is suddenly down a huge amount relative to gold, mm-hmm. then that's saying that we're going into a, a contraction and it happens uh, virtually on every contraction. So actually, when you look at the gold-silver ratio, you can call it the metallic credit spread. And when you're in a boom, silver outperforms gold, so the ratio goes down. And then when you're in a contraction, it goes the other way, where silver underperforms gold, and the ratio goes up. And you go back to 1980 on the big Hunt Brothers promotion on silver, that was they had looked at historically and the gold-silver ratio had spent a fair amount of time, 100 years or so, close to 16. And uh, that was the promotion and they did hit 16. And then the contract, that then problem, that blowout in 1980, uh, prevailed for a long time, unwinding all of those positions in gold-silver as well as uh, crude oil. I remember that was part of the game in 1980. But then in 19, yeah, end of there, 1980, 1990, 
was the last of the liquidation of those problems and the two big banks, Chemical Bank and Chase Manhattan, were in serious problems. Uh, the Fed had to bail them out and uh, it lowered the reserve requirements. But the gold-silver ratio got up to 100. Right. And from 16. Now, that was a lot of pain for the for the silver guys. And this is, of course, this is now easy to use as a target. We're now about 75 on the ratio. And I'm quite convinced that it will rise actually in, uh, in the, within the next few weeks. And the, the uh, gold-silver ratio go yeah. to 100 next and, uh, it's already been to 100 back yeah, in so 1990 91 so. so it's been there once it can go back again and uh, you think it potentially could hit that huh yeah the gold silver ratio yeah, yeah. It could go to 100 and that's you know there's uh, been some a guy I can't remember the name or the of the president of the company or the name of the company here but for the last couple of years, he's been very strong on saying the gold silver ratio has got to go all the way down to 16. Right. But all I can say is that's opinion, and it's not based on any historical uh, evidence at all. And the historical evidence is that when you're in a credit contraction, the uh, silver plunges relative to gold. So that, yeah. and that, that, that was effective back in the 1800s when uh, Great Britain, the senior economy, was on a gold standard to... Gold and silver still did what they do, and whether you're in a boom or in a contraction, when it doesn't matter whether the senior currency was convertible into gold or not. It uh, That's the way the somehow the gold-silver market is very sophisticated when it comes to either a credit expansion or a credit contraction. And I can't believe how it happens. You can see it day to day uh, where, oops, we got a little worry this week, gold-silver ratio up. Or hey, everything's good this week, so the gold silver ratio down. And um, but it it it's there. It's been there for a few hundred years. This, as a matter of fact, you can say that where you've got uh, you know a long data trail, uh, three hundred years of it, anyways. That and you know what's going on in the general economy. The gold silver ratio does what it does. It goes up in a contraction, and if you get now the gold silver ratio breaking beyond eighty. Uh, that will be saying that a contraction is at hand or you're actually in one. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Well, this is going to be really interesting to watch, Bob, and see how it uh, unfolds. I think uh, well, we Kerry, are long you know, I, I like to say to my friends that I consider it a, a privilege to be alive and vertical in these absolutely incredible financial and political markets. This is this is wonderful history. Very exciting, and uh, I'm glad to be watching it. History in the making, as they say. And yep. uh, Bob, we want to find out more about you. Uh, where's the best place to find your work? Yep, actually, uh, just Google Bob Hoy, B O B H O Y E, or mm -hmm. we have the website at institutionaladvisors.com. And uh, that's all it takes. Uh, we've uh, Brian Ripley looks after our inquiries, and we can put people onto uh, a trial basis uh, where you get the fresh stuff for four or five weeks, and then we would welcome your subscriptions. Okay, sounds good, Bob. Uh, hey, any questions, comments for Bob, myself, or anyone else you hear on the show? Just uh, write us at kl at Lutz dot com. And the Twitter feeds at Carrie Lutz. The Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Bob, uh, it's always a pleasure to have you. We'll talk to you again real soon. Thanks for coming. Looking by. forward to it, Carrie. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. They fell something in half. So that then reinforced uh, my point of view is that there were a lot of people in the oil patch stocks who are basically were holding for a disaster in the Middle East 
and or a disaster in the Gulf, and it didn't work. So now I think these people are liquidating holdings because the two, the reason for holding was a, a, a hedge against disaster. We've had disasters, and it doesn't work. And of course, this reason for that is the immense uh, increase in production uh, from the tight oil, the shale stuff, and also natural gas market is changing. So this is uh, fascinating stuff from the historical point of view because the uh, price of crude oil is going to continue to stay weak, and and it's it's a, a it's a resource technological revolution. And if you go back to the 1880s in um, Montana, the uh, the base metal miners learned how to mine large or good size high grade copper and the production of sword. Then in 1910 is when Bingham Canyon was put into production. Bingham Canyon is just south of Salt Lake City. And that was the first really low-grade copper system to be put in, one of these copper porphyries. And Bingham Canyon is still operating. So that was a tremendous revolution in the, in producing low-grade copper. Then in the 1970s, you had Newmont uh, learned how to put into production at that time, which was, you know, um, uh, considered a low-grade system, a large low-grade system with the Carlin, Nevada type deposits, mm-hmm. and that was a revolution. So now, what you have now with the the shale uh, production and the ability to discover it and the ability to put it into production is absolutely phenomenal. And it. it- FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Carrie Lutz, and it is August 30th, 2017. Hard to believe summer is just about over. Well, what's happening in Houston? What's happening with the dollar? What's happening with gold? Where's it heading? Bob Hoy is with us uh, once again. Always great to hear from you, Bob, and love to hear what your wisdom and your experience tell us about what's happening now. Harry, thanks for your kind comments, and it's good to be with you. Yeah, you've got huge news items. The Houston storm, and it's doing immense damage. Of course, the left has gone crazy with it. This is all due to CO2 and modern industry, but that's not the case. Um, It'll eventually get sorted out and fixed, but in the meantime, it's a very impressive amount of damage being done. But the interesting thing is that it really didn't push the price of crude oil up that much. Yeah, you've had a sympathetic rally in uh, gasoline, but then you've had a huge amount of North American refining capacity down. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's something going on with the oil patch stocks, and that goes back to where the resource sector got hit down to January uh, 2016, when the price of crude fell to $27. And also base metals got hit very hard in that, and the base metal mining index, XME, it, it fell to a third of its high. And um, then you also on the same move, which was a disaster in crude oil, the oil stocks, XLE, only very closely, and the the credit, the excesses in technical side, that basically momentum and sentiment are, have been right up there, about as high as you can get. And so we're just waiting for it to roll out. Now, as a game thing, we go back to our work on credit spreads and the uh, yield curve, and particularly of interest, and I'm just working on it right now, is the uh, short dated. Uh, interest rates such as now treasury bills. And in the past, there used to be the uh, call money, which was the rate at which uh, brokers and bankers would lend money to each other. And it was a very good representative of money market conditions. So in the bubble in 1873, you had, as usual, short rates went up with the boom. That one was until June, and then it declined. And the the decline in the uh, then the call money uh, indicated that the biggest part of the bubble was in and people were getting careful. So, and that bubble peaked in September of 1873 in the U.S. Then the next one, 1929, in in June, the T-bill rate went all the way up till June and started coming down. 
And that then was the signal of uh, that the boom would soon be over. And here we are now, The uh, this time the three-month bill increased to 1.18%, which is not a big number, but then it was down to 0.18%. So it's a big, it's a big uh, relative game. Mm. And that peaked in June and has been declining. It's down to, well, it got down to 1.00 1. a week or so ago, and then it's just having a little correction here now to 103. So just looking at short dated rates, the action is a natural step to uh, efficiencies in, 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 a, in yet another resource sector. So the price of crude is going to be uh, continuing weak, uh, we figure. So, and this goes back to oh, 2014 when uh, it was trading about 107, and I pointed out that in previous <laughs> serious contractions, the price would fall to one-third of the high or one-quarter of the high, and those prices, I remember, based on the 107, worked out to 37 or 27, and we didn't know which. But briefly got down to 27. So, mm-hmm. but this would be on annual averages. So, uh, you get something like, say, 30 dollars on an annual average. Oh now, that gosh. will be interesting to the industry. So then, what we want to do is also take a look at uh, at the base metals, and we thought that they would rally this year out through it in into into August and they have done very well the index uh, GYX is 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 done well and uh, within it uh, zinc has had a hot run we think uh, copper has a little further to go but one of the things that we are looking at here Kerry is that this could be the culmination of the great bull market for stocks Mm. And we've got a historical guideline for this one, and that mm. is that since the first bubble, the South Sea bubble in 1720 blew out, that one's notorious, like people know about that one. But decades ago when I was doing the historical research, I noticed that there was a big commodity peak nine years earlier. And I thought, well, oh, that's interesting. So let's look at the other big well-known bubble, which was 1929. And indeed, you had a huge commodity blowout in 1920. So you got this nine-year spread. So then I went looking through the rest of history, and yeah, there was a huge bubble blew out in 1825, and there you had a, a, a good commodity high in 1816. So this is the pattern. 1873 is another one, big bubble in stocks, culminated in 1873, and it was preceded by a commodity high and a high for the CPI in 1864. So here we are. Now, the, the last really big high in commodities was 2008. Remember when crude oil got up to $147? Mm-hmm. So here we are nine years later on that old model. So if the stock markets were not speculative now, then that relationship of nine years later would be of no interest. But what is of interest, Carrie, is that you have a speculative stock market. And indeed, our technical uh, measures put this as it's you, you know the last time you had speculative excesses like this was in 2007 and in two in 2000 going into March 2000. So uh, yeah, you've got something historically going on. Now, of course, those two dramatic bull markets, the uh, dot com bubble in that culminated in 2000, was unique, but it wasn't preceded by uh, an important high in commodities nine years earlier. Mm-hmm. But on that one, we just used the uh, yield curve and credit spreads to determine that maybe the top might be around March, and it, it was. And then in 2007, that was the same thing. We're using the changes in the yield curve and credit spreads to call the, the culmination of that one. And then now, but that one didn't have, wasn't preceded by an important high in commodities nine years earlier. So this one, mm-hmm. Kerry, has very important histor- historical features. Right. So this is where we're watching 